1972, in the House of Flowers, I believe it was October, just after Rathiatra, it might have been September of 1972, I uh, was at a lecture that Srila Prabhupada was giving. And this lecture was kind of significant. Uh, Bhutatma was fanning Srila Prabhupada on the stage. There were maybe 1,000, 1,200 people there, an indoor uh, auditorium with a stage. And Bhutatma was fanning Srila Prabhupada with a, a, uh, a peacock fan. And the handle of the peacock fan was, was more than, than 12 feet long. It was this humongous like something out of Alibaba and the Forty Thieves. And as they were fanning Srila Prabhupada, I was trying to listen very carefully. It was hard at first to understand what Srila Prabhupada was saying. But I remember specifically there was one point that Srila Prabhupada had uh, come to at the question and answer section of his lecture that really gave me inspiration that here is my guru. Because previously I was, like everyone else, looking for so many spiritual masters going through uh, TM and uh, Autobiography of a Yogi and Baba Ram Das and everything. And when Srila Prabhupada spoke, uh, at one point in the question and answers, one young man stood up and said, Swamiji, uh, according to the teachings of Baha'i, Srila Prabhupada interrupted and said, we are not talking here of Baha'i, we are talking of Krishna. And he said, well, Bahula says, and Prabhupada interrupted him immediately again. We are interested in here, and we are talking here of what Krishna says. And then he said again, well, the Baha'i faith, and Prabhupada said, please sit down and be quiet. We are speaking only what Krishna says. And to me, at that time, when I had seen all these other bogus yogis, and they were uh, accepting everything and uh, putting everything together as one, uh, I was never very attracted and when I heard that Prabhupada was so decisive and, and strict and, and very forceful, I immediately thought that this is my guru. I want to take initiation from this spiritual master. So then I joined sometime later, that's another story, but uh, that impressed me very much, that first meeting with Srila Prabhupada in the House of Flowers. At another time in 1976, Gopavinda Paul Prabhu had asked us to guard Srila Prabhupada's door in Vrindavan, which was a, a great honor to be able to guard Srila Prabhupada's door. At the same time, no one ever thought Srila Prabhupada would come out and say anything or uh, have any conversation. We were rank and file devotees. No big guns, no one who was in a GBC meeting or uh, made any decisions, especially at that time, rank and file Prabhus. And so, uh, Srila Prabhupada was in his rooms in Vrindavan, and it was uh, the time for all the devotees to go to the Fogel Ashram for Prashadam, 12 30, 1 o'clock. I was sitting on the porch. Uh, I didn't know what Prabhupada's rooms were like at that time. Uh, neither did I know if any other servants were there. And all of a sudden there was a, a buzzer from inside the room. And I kept reading. It was the seventh candle of Srimad Bhagavatam. I thought, this is wonderful. I'm in Vrindavan. I'm reading the Bhagavatam. Prabhupada's in his room. He just rang the buzzer. Some servant from somewhere is going to go and take care of it. You know, everything's so wonderful in Vrindavan. And all of a sudden, within a few seconds, Srila Prabhupada was at the screen door there in his quarters in Vrindavan. And I immediately stood up. I went to offer obeisances and Prabhupada said, I am an old man and I am ringing and you are a young man and I must come to you. And my heart, I looked at you, Prabhupada, I had no idea. Gopavrin, I tried to explain, you know, that I was new to this job. I had no idea what was the room. And he, Prabhupada said, I am the spiritual master, and you are the disciple, and I must come to you? And again, I was, I couldn't even say anything. I was struck. Prabhupada said, I am the master, and you are the servants, and there are six of you. 
I, was, I couldn't even understand what Prabhupada was talking about. There are six of us. And I must come to you? And then Prabhupada said, go get Pusta Krishna. So I knew Prabhupada went back in his room, and I knew I was, adrenaline was flowing like anything. I had barely ever had any association with Srila Prabhupada face to face. And Srila Prabhupada was, uh, this was one of the first encounters, and I had blown it major. So I immediately was ready to run to go get Pusta Krishna Maharaj at the Fogel Ashram. But I realized that if I left my guard, my post as guard, that something could happen and I would be responsible. So I was waiting for some devotee to come by. One devotee came by. I yelled at him, please come quickly. We've got to get Pusta Krishna. Prabhupada needs him. And unfortunately, he said, no entiendo, Prabhu. Yeah. He, he spoke only Spanish. At the time, I didn't speak too much Spanish. And the buzzer rang again. So I ran into Srila Prabhupada's quarters. I had never been there before in Vrindavan. I offered obeisances, and as I'm offering obeisances, Prabhupada said, where's Pusta Krishna? So I immediately stood up before I finished my obeisances because I didn't want Prabhupada to have to wait for my answer. I was feeling very foolish. I didn't know what to do, which way to go, what to say. And uh, I told Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, he's at the, the Fogel Ashram taking Prashara, and Prabhupada said, go in the back and get one of the other servants. So as I walked in the back, there are two doorways. One leads to the back of Vrindavan, uh, uh, Prabhupada's rooms in Vrindavan. One leads to the servants' quarters. And uh, unfortunately, I entered the servants' quarters. And Srila Prabhupada said, no, the other door. And I realized then that one should uh, feel like a fool in front of the spiritual master, but one shouldn't act like a fool. Uh, before the spiritual master. So I went and I got, Harisari was there in the back preparing some prasadam, doing some devotional service for Srila Prabhupada. And I uh, told him, Srila Prabhupada needs you immediately. You've got to uh, come quickly. It's an emergency. He said, okay, go around through this little doorway, go around the front again, and keep guarding, and uh, I'll tell you what to do. I'll go take care of everything. I'll go talk to Srila Prabhupada. So I went to my post. And I was still reading the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, but this time my eyes were bugged out of my head. I couldn't even read a word. I was looking at the pages, but my mind was reeling in complete anxiety that I had offended Srila Prabhupada. I hadn't pleased him. What an opportunity. And here I had blown it uh, in service of my spiritual master. So Pusta Krishna Maharaj at that time came back, and he told me, you'll do something nice for Prabhupada. We found out that Prabhupada wanted to go to Bhagaji's across the way for lunch prasadam. It wasn't as big as an emergency as I had thought. Uh, although Srila Prabhupada needed the, uh, the arrangements to be made. So Pusta Krishna Maharaj told me that uh, just hold this nice umbrella. There was a very big umbrella with a three foot, four foot pole. Hold it over Srila Prabhupada's head and you can do some nice service. Walk Srila Prabhupada over to Bhagaji's house so as I'm getting prepared to do that, Srila Prabhupada was coming out in a few minutes. The kirtan started. A few sannyasis came by. And uh, two of the senior sannyasis, at that time Guru Kripa Maharaj and Yasodhananda Swami, came by and saw me with the pole and said, what are you doing? I said, well, Srila Prabhupada's coming out, and I'm going to put the umbrella over his head and walk him to Bhagaji's. And of course, being a brahmachari, they pulled rank immediately, took the umbrella from my hands, and uh, they were going to perform that service, which was only appropriate. So then I'm walking down the stairs, joining in the kirtan, maybe half a dozen devotees, ten devotees there, and I realized that, that Krishna was just arranging. There was nothing I can do to please my spiritual master, that I had just blown a, a, a great opportunity. So I was actually crying. I think physically I was crying. As Srila Prabhupada came out, I offered dandabats on the stairs, three, four stairs going to the gate, leading outside to go to Bhagaji's across the alley in Vrindavan. And as I'm offering obeisances, offering dandabats, uh, Srila Prabhupada's coming down the stairs. I didn't even plan it. Uh, as I'm coming up, I'm, I was crying. My mind was reeling that, Prabhupada, please forgive me. I'm so sorry that I offended you or didn't know how to act properly. And as I stood up, hands folded, uh, Srila Prabhupada looked over 
and said, Jai. To me, I knew it was to me, Prabhupada said, Jai. And I knew at that moment, all the anxiety, all the fear, all the tears were all washed away. I became completely joyous because I knew that Srila Prabhupada knew my heart. He knew my intentions and that he was forgiving me for whatever offense that I had committed. Uh, and then Srila Prabhupada went on to Bhagaji's and I was in ecstasy for the, <laughs> the rest of that day at least. Lokanat Maharaj was uh, there on the walk, Srila Prabhupada had asked him at one point of the walk what these particular type of berries on the side of the road were. And Lokanat Maharaj was describing that these are such and such berries Great yogis and, and, and uh, sannyasis subsist on the berries, perform meditation and subsist on these berries for their foodstuffs only. Prabhupada said, yes, our men should learn how to do like this. Chant Hare Krishna, eat a few berries, and once in a week go down to the village and beg a japati from the village. So devotees were looking at each other because sometimes Srila Prabhupada would give instructions that would change everyone's life forever. Go to China or who knows. So probably was our guru, he could say anything. So immediately a few of the GBC men, maybe some of the householders, uh, said, Prabhupada, we have to preach, we have to go, we have to go back and, and uh, perform our activities. But I said, no, you should learn to be able to do like this. Chant Hare Krishna, eat few berries, sit in the forest, and once in a week go down to the village and beg some japati. And devotees were, everyone was very silent. They thought, my God, we may have to do this. And then Prabhupada went on to say, of course, Lokanat Maharaj was very happy. He was hoping that this would be, I think he was hoping this would be one instruction uh, as a very austere, saintly person. Prabhupada then said, this is sadhu. This is saintly. We should be able to do like this. This is the life of a sadhu. So that was kind of a significant uh, little pastime with Lokanat Maharaj and Prabhupada. Another time, in 76, in Mayapur, we were in a little room conversation with uh, Srila Prabhupada. He was speaking mostly in, in Hindi. We were there in the front row. It was a very small room in Sri Mayapur. And people were being asked to come in and then go out. And uh, Mahabudi Prabhu was at the door giving people the instruction, who should come in, who should go out. At a certain point uh, during the darshan, a big plate of sweets came into the room. Mahabudi was holding onto the sweets. A few people noticed it was a very large plate of sweets. So Srila Prabhupada stopped his darshan and asked Mahabudi, uh, why don't you pass out these sweets? And Mahabudi responded that, well, Srila Prabhupada, I'll pass out the sweets as they all leave, as the devotees leave. And Prabhupada was sitting with one knee up, I remember. We were there in the front row with Tripurari Marj. And Prabhupada looked around and said, leave? They will never leave. And everybody in the audience was, Jai Prabhupada. Everyone was considered that that was a blessing that Prabhupada was getting. Of course, making a joke also. In 1976 in New Vrindavan, we were fortunate to uh, be in a darshan with Srila Prabhupada. It was those, the darshans during the, uh, when Prabhupada was lecturing on the Bhavan Journal, which became the book Civilization and Transcendence. Prabhupada was uh, giving, there were questions from the Bhavan Journal, and Srila Prabhupada was giving the answers outdoors uh, at one householder's place in New Vrindavan, summer of 1976. And during this time, Srila Prabhupada had been lecturing the devotees that they should know the books like a lawyer knows his law books. We should study the books very carefully. And at that time, I believe, 76, summer, it was still, Seventh Canto had just come out. Devotees didn't know most of those verses from the Prahlad uh, pastimes. So Srila Prabhupada came to a point in the lecture where he was giving some discussion on the teachings of Prahlad. Uh, and he said, so go find that verse. I think it was maybe Naivodvijay Parudaratya Vaitaranyas, uh, which was new to devotees at that time. Seventh Canto had just come out. Some verse that was new to devotees. 
So the sannyasis were feverishly going through the books, Dristadumna Maharaj, Kirtananda Swami, because they knew the days previous, Srila Prabhupada had become a little bit disturbed when the devotees couldn't find the verses properly and had given that quote, learn the books like a lawyer knows his law books. So devotees were feverishly looking through the book. They couldn't find it, maybe three, four minutes. Many devotees were here to witness this. I know Naikatma was with us and many devotees. I think it's even Harisari told this story in his diary. Srila Prabhupada then asked, we were all very amazed, give me the book. They gave Srila Prabhupada the book. He opened the book very nonchalantly and handed it to one of his servants and said, read. And then they read the exact verse that Srila Prabhupada had quoted and devotees were amazed. Prabhupada didn't, the place was not marked. The Prabhupada simply took the book, opened it, it was right there. Devotees in amazement at this transcendental uh, magic, at Srila Prabhupada's uh, abilities. Uh, in unison, everyone was, Jai Prabhupada. And I remember Prabhupada put his head back and Acha, you know, was a very, Prabhupada was smiling and put his head back, yes. Uh, we were all extremely amazed. Still, it's an amazing story. Thinking that sometimes all the other devotees, the servants would leave and I would be there fanning Srila Prabhupada. And I was thinking at one time, how is it that the spiritual master is sleeping? Uh, the Shastra says that the spiritual master never sleeps. So I was speculating and perhaps bothering Srila Prabhupada on a psychic level. Prabhupada was sitting there on his bed cross-legged uh, in the inner veranda, excuse me, the outer veranda on the outside in his rooms upstairs in Vrindavan. And he was seemingly snoring and in deep sleep. Lip was moving back and forth and I thought, Prabhupada's snoring, he's sleeping. But I thought the spiritual master never sleeps. And as I'm thinking this nonsense, uh, right in the middle of my thought, as Srila Prabhupada's snoring, he said, what time is it? Completely clear and attentive. And I realized then that Srila Prabhupada knew exactly what I was thinking and wanted to destroy that thought. Uh, 8.33 Srila Prabhupada. And immediately in my mind, I just... I realized I shouldn't think anything in front of my spiritual master except Krishna conscious thoughts, love and devotion, uh, and the Maha Mantra, chanting of Hare Krishna. We did write one letter. I was a Sankirtan devotee, so in those days we were told, don't bother Srila Prabhupada, he's busy translating, he's uh, busy traveling. Just any questions that you have, any problems, go to your local GBC, talk to the sannyasis. So in 1974, after we were already initiated, we were doing Sankirtan in Spokane at the Spokane World's Fair uh, at the, in, uh, I think it was April of 1974. And there were many Sankirtan devotees that were there doing the, the uh, uh, book distribution there. So the temple president had written one letter to Srila Prabhupada inviting him to come and, uh, and speak at the World's Fair. And then we had written a letter from the Sankirtan side uh, in giving Srila Prabhupada the information of how many books were being distributed and how the Sankirtan was going there at that time. This was the only letter we really ever wrote to Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada responded in uh, a letter uh, a few weeks later in 1974, uh, April of 74, that uh, to the questions of the temple president, the in invitation of the temple president, he responded that if you simply distribute my books, distribute prashadam, and have harinam, it will be as good as my personally being there. And then from our letter, uh, it was a very a response that we've never forgotten, a response that uh, we were waiting to hear some kind of instruction like this, direct instruction. Prabhupada had said in, in that letter that uh, I'm very keen on the distribution of my books 
and I am ever indebted to all of you for your untiring efforts to see that every man and woman in the United States gets a book. So, of course, when we got this letter, any letters that we heard from Srila Prabhupada to anyone were extremely enlivening and gave us purpose and direction. And this particular letter, we, many of the devotees that were there, Savas Prabhu and uh, Tripurari Maharaj at the time, uh, so many book distributors, Magendra was there from here, a lot of devotees that are around, they took this, that this is their mission for Srila Prabhupada throughout this lifetime, to make sure that every man and woman in the United States gets a book. So that was a, a nice letter, a very nice letter in 74. So I believe that one Mataji had asked Srila Prabhupada a question about the women being very aggressive. Of course, I think this came up in a letter also, but I believe that this came up at, at that time also. And Srila Prabhupada responded that, yes, we should, for the Mataji's, he was giving instruction, we can be a lion on the chase and a lamb at home. At that same time, uh, Srila Prabhupada was shown a very famous cartoon that was in the Chicago Sun-Times, I believe, that summer. Uh, we had just received it. It had just come out, as a matter of fact. And I believe Jayatirtha gave the cartoon, showed the cartoon to Srila Prabhupada. And in the first frame of the cartoon, it showed a devotee approaching uh, a traveler, a passenger, at the airport or in some spot. Uh, the second frame showed the passenger, you know, denying the book, not wanting to take it. In the third frame of the cartoon, uh, there was the scuffle, pow, bam, kaboom. In the next frame, it showed the Bhagavatam, the book, in the traveler's neck, down the traveler's neck, and the devotee walking away, I believe, counting some money. So we were fearful that Srila Prabhupada would, would find this offensive and uh, would be upset with our zealous, zealousness in distributing by seeing this caricature of the devotee's distribution. But on the contrary, Srila Prabhupada laughed uh, and seemed to be amused and pleased with the cartoon. When they would read the letters to Srila Prabhupada, there were a few letters that were very outstanding. I remember one letter that they had read. We had the fortune of being there uh, when they would read the letters to Srila Prabhupada. And one letter they were discussing of the preaching activities of Srila Prabhupada's disciples in Yugoslavia. And they had given description of how the people would leave with their, uh, would be given prashad, uh, harinam, and books. And as they would leave, they would leave with their hands full of books, their stomachs full of prashadam, and their purses emptied. And Srila Prabhupada responded, this was my program. Hands full, stomachs full, and purses emptied. Prabhupada said, that's my program. And then Prabhupada said that when I hear the stories uh, of their preaching, uh, I forget about my diseased condition. Uh, it makes me feel very happy. And another time there was some uh, different achievements that were taking place, a restaurant that had been opened in South Africa, another activity that was going on. And Srila Prabhupada said, when I hear of the achievements of my disciples, my chest swells with pride for them. So there were little statements at that time that Srila Prabhupada was making that were, uh, that ring through, and will ring through, I'm sure, for decades and centuries. Jai